Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm ABC 10 meteorologist Brendan Minchef. Uh, a little known but important piece of the water puzzle here in California is the State Water Project. And this April, they released a new plan, a risk-informed strategic plan that has to do with how we handle water within the State Water Project. And this includes the Delta Conveyance Project, also known as the Delta Tunnel. So I invited the State Water Project to stop by and have a conversation with me. And here's how it went. I'm joined on the program by uh, Tony Myers. You are the State Water Project Principal Operating Officer. Tony, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Brendan. So I think most importantly, what is the State Water Project? Well, the State Water Project is the largest state-owned water facility in the United States and one of the largest in the world. It stretches more than 700 miles, more than two-thirds of the length of the state, and it also captures and stores up to 5.8 million acre feet of water every year. That's enough water to cover 44,000 football fields in 100 feet of water. It's an enormous amount of water, also equal to about 15 million homes that it can deliver water to with that amount of storage. It also has the capacity to um, deliver water to 27 million Californians, two thirds of the state's population as well as providing water to 750,000 acres of irrigated farmland, the farms that feed the nation. It produces hydroelectric, clean hydroelectric power. It also provides flood protection. It gives the opportunity to provide recreational opportunities. There is also benefits for environmental needs, as well as providing the and driving the California economy, the fifth largest economy in the world, providing more than 8.7 million jobs in the California economy. And you said there's more than 2,000 people that work for the State Water Project. So it's not just the water that provides jobs, but exactly. people work on the water. Two, two, uh, 2,400 people, 2,400 people providing uh, services to help keep the engine oiled and running so that we can provide that water throughout the state from Northern California all the way down through Southern California. Uh, but I, it, it's been around a while, right, the State Water Project. Um, there's been just uh, the month of April released the new Elevate 28, the strategic uh, risk-informed plan for the State Water Project. What is Elevate 28 and how is it different from what we've already been doing with the State Water Project? Elevate 28 is our new strategic plan, as you just said, and it is a risk-informed strategic plan, something we haven't done before. It's also going to be a plan that we actively implement with ongoing daily activities. Elevate to 28 was created for the need to address a number of accelerating risks that we're facing since our last plan was published in 2019. Key among those are our new hotter and drier climate reality that we're facing in, in light of climate change. Like you said, the State Water Project is not young. We've got assets that are 40 to 60 years old. It is an infrastructure that has a lot of aging infrastructure that we have to make sure that we maintain and uh, uh, restore and continue to have operable to meet the demands of the state's water system. It also has uh, uh, needs to address the mounting continued more uh, difficult environmental regulations that we have to operate within as well as, and this is one of the ones that really is difficult to get our hands around right now, but I see a good path forward, the acceleration of retiring people that are exiting with 25, 30, and 40 years experience. And as they call it, the silver tsunami, we have to accelerate our ability to train up new leaders and step into the gap to be able to take over and continue this incredible operation. And there were some goals lined out, five major goals uh, spelled out in the Elevate 28 program uh, or, or plan, I should say. And one of them uh, was uh, be employer of choice. Right. Um, and that has to do with the wave of retiring workers, I assume. That's correct. Yeah, so be the employer of choice is one of the ones that we've identified as, as very key to ensure that we have a sustainable workforce. We've adopted what we call our One Blue Team Academy, where we stand up new leaders, bringing them up in the organization and training them up in a more accelerated and more thorough route than they would just normally have as they progress through the ranks 
of uh, promotions. And this is allowing us the opportunity to put people in position for success, which will also be our success. And there's a multitude of things of hiring and recruiting and, and initiatives that we're, we're attacking in order to make sure that we can get the best and the brightest people with a, a mission for state service to ensure that we have this uh, human right to water clearly defined. Uh, some of the other goals I wanted to ask you about, uh, one of them is accelerate adaptation and strengthen resiliency for a change in climate. And then uh, part of that maybe is goal five as well, optimizing infrastructure, financial integrity and operations. Um, can you just go into those a little bit? Yeah, let's do the last one first, the optimizing infrastructure and financial integrity. We're continuing to develop and, and refine our accounting procedures. It's one of the most complicated water systems as far as how you track costs and bill the 29 contractors that are our uh, constituents that we supply water to. So we're continuing to refine those and get better at the financial integrity component so that it's really clear that people understand and can predict what their costs are going to be into the future as we lay on additional costs so that they can continue to be affordable. And the aging infrastructure, the infrastructure component of that goal, we've got 40 to 60 year old assets as I previously said and just think of it as driving around in a 40 to 60 year old car that's continuing to work every day, day after day. The maintenance on that is incredible to keep it fully functioning and operational as a classic car. The, the uh, climate goals for climate change, we can't ignore those. Our hotter and drier climate reality is already here. Hey, we're not something we're talking about into the future. It's something that we've got to not just plan for, but we got to start enacting in order to make sure we can meet those uh, uh, elements. And one of our greatest climate adaptation strategies that we have right now to ensure that we can continue delivering affordable, clean, sustainable, and resilient water into the future for the next 20 to 40 years is the Delta Conveyance Project. Its ability to provide water at a separate location rather than in South Delta take the intakes up in North Delta, completely go underneath the Delta right now and discharge directly into the aqueduct south of the Delta without a minimal impact, I'll call them minimal impacts, compared to the amount of impacts that there would be with the water flowing and then pumping out in the south. We'll continue to have both a north and a south operation, two different knobs to be able to operate the system, two mutual exclusive ways to move the water and in fact, this year and this year alone, if Delta Conveyance had been constructed by now, we'd have been able to move more than 900,000 acre feet of water that we haven't been able to, to benefit the residents of California. And at roughly three homes per acre foot, that's 2.7 million acre feet of water you could fully supply to uh, 2.7 million homes that you could supply water to that may not get it this year. And so the benefits of that, oh, and also be able to do that without impacting endangered species. We could do that without harming the fish that are in the delta or trying to migrate through the delta. So it's a very key element of our strategy for mitigating for climate change and climate adaptation. Uh, and, uh, there obviously is a little controversy with the tunnel, as I'm, I'm yeah. sure the state is well aware. Uh, one of the groups uh, that's been particularly vocal up here in Northern California is Restore the Delta. Um, They've said, in part, uh, the governor, uh, Newsom, cannot claim to put water equity at the forefront while ignoring the catastrophic impact the tunnel would have, uh, referring to the ecosystem and communities in the Delta. Um, we've heard this argument before, but obviously the Delta tunnel sounds important for climate change and also earthquakes is one of the arguments as well. Um, what, is, what is the state's response to critics like that? I would have to say that and excuse me, if you take this personally, it's a little short-sighted. The ability to have a water system that you've modeled six ways from Sunday, that you understand that you're only taking that water when the water is available, not at low flow conditions, but when there's a lot of excess water where you've got your bypass, it's just uh, flowing out to the, to the ocean through the bay. You have the ability to capture that water and move that water with minimal impacts through the tunnel and not through the delta. The, the, the key elements of the delta that, from a climate change standpoint, that are real 
where the real catastrophe would occur is if we had an earthquake of roughly a 6.3, 6.5 size on any one of the multiple faults that underlie the delta could levy, level the levees that are in the delta and cause the water system to completely come to a halt. That would be the cat catastrophe that is being explained. The rising sea levels put additional pressures on those levees, as does the subsidence in the delta that puts pressures on those levees. Some of those islands have land behind them that has subsided over 30 feet, and the stresses on those levees are incredible. And to continue to be able to manage the ability to move water through the delta, where 50% of all the water that moves through California to serve water populations flows through the delta is critical to get that under control and make sure we have a robust system that can uh, address earthquakes and climate change and continue to provide that clean, affordable, sustainable, and resilient water for the people of California. And how have the last couple of years, uh, they've been particularly wet? Um, you know, last winter up in Northern California and this winter down in Southern California has had a lot of rain. So how have these last couple of years uh, benefited the state water project, really pulling us out of uh, that severe drought we were in? Um, and like you said, you know, it's not always going to be wet. Correct. It's not. Because we saw three years ago, three water years, counting this year's one, last year's two, back to 21, 22. It was the third driest year on record. And it was a real problem because we were at health and safety deliveries with 5% allocation of the state water project assets. And that was problematic in just being able to figure out how you were going to be able to sustain water if we had another uh, um, dry year on the back of that. The interesting thing in that year, Brendan, was that had Delta Conveyance been constructed, we could have moved an additional 236,000 acre feet for enough for about 880,000 homes, which would have increased our allocation by almost two, maybe, uh, maybe two and a half. So the Delta Conveyance Project helps bridge some of these, these, these uh, shortcomings when we've got dry years, as well as last year with the wet years that we had, filled up all the reservoirs, and not only filled up the reservoirs of the state water project and the state system, it filled up everybody else's. We didn't have any place to put the water that was so much water. So we parked the extra water up in Oroville to move this year, and uh, the ability to fill the reservoirs, Diamond Valley down in Southern California as well, was really critical for the last year for the sustainability of California's water. And it's one of the things you're going to see with climate change. It's this climate whiplash that you guys have probably talked about here at the station where you get a really dry year and then whap, you get a really wet year. And even last year, you guys were probably really talking about how we had floods during a year where we had drought. And they're occurring in the same year. How does that happen? I've never seen anything like that. I immediately thought, what are they talking about? That makes no sense. But it was happening because we were still under drought conditions, still under drought restrictions, but we were having flooding conditions that were providing water that we're needing now. And the benefit for having back-to-back -back water years this year is we've got more fish than we've seen in a long time swimming up through the rivers. And so the, the Delta Cabayans project, part of that is the tunnel. Um, are we close to putting shovels in the ground, or are we still years away? From we that? are a long ways from where we were. It's probably one of the most studied projects in the history of California. We have a certified EIR. We're working on all the permits right now. The water board permit for change of place of diversion, that was submitted, and they'll be working through that through the next couple of years and hopefully have Delta Stewardship Council permits sometime, hopefully by the end of 26. That'll allow us to get land acquisition going that we're going to need in order to place certain assets of the Delta Conveyance Project. So you probably won't see construction starting until sometime late 29. Pick a round number, say 2030, and you'll see the project be complete and operational sometime around 2044. Uh, well, maybe lastly here, let me ask you what else is going on with the State Water Project. The Delta Conveyance Project is something you guys are working on. Uh, the Elevate to 28. What else? What else is in your world right now? We have a lot of projects. I want to make one statement real quick that 
one of the things that we do as an organization is we ensure we align with our mother organization, which is DWR. And all the things that we do have to stem out of that mission, which is sustainably manage the water resources of California in conjunction with other agencies in support of the state's residences and to benefit, restore, and enhance the human and natural environments. Everything we do has to align with that mission. And so what we are about is ensuring that we've got our, our uh, asset management, maintenance management programs up to snuff so that when we have the ability to move water like we did last year and this year, we can put all the units on and move as much water as we can, get it down to where it needs to be so that others can fill up their reservoirs as well. That's one of the biggest things we do. We also are really vested in environmental restoration and enhancement. Part of the work that we've done is to create over 8,000 acres of tidal habitat restoration around the Delta for the benefit of the fish and the ecosystem. We're in the process of completing our last three out of 11 projects, and then we'll have fully completed them by the end of 26, which will be a huge milestone. We also have touch points into the Sioux Marsh to help manage the marsh lands that are there, as well as you know anything that we do, we have to ensure that we mitigate impacts along the way to leave a very small footprint for the things that we do, which is why I don't think Delta Conveyance is as big a catastrophe as a lot of people seem to say it is, because we're being very cautious and very concerned about how we implement the work that we're going to do. All right, Tony, thanks for joining us today. Brandon, appreciate it. Thank you.